Nokia and there's like 15 or 16 William Hamilton. You're like, well, you know, there's no pressure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's well, you know, of... <laughs> just pick one. Well, well Scandinavian yeah, stuff's popular these days with the Vikings, which I think is a Canadian <laughs> show, actually. So. Oh, it is actually, I think, yeah. I thought it was originally, yeah. Okay, very good. So uh, uh, maybe we can, uh, you know, for uh, in the interest of time, maybe we can start uh, the talk. So uh, as uh, you have heard, uh, we have uh, a particular William Hamilton today <laughs> from uh, McGill. He has done some uh, very nice and phenomenal uh, work on uh, graph neural nets and graph representation. He even has a, a monograph, I guess. Uh, uh, on the on the topic, so uh, and today we are very happy to have him here uh, talk about uh, his uh, research in this area. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And indeed, um, today I'll be talking to him at a re relatively high level. So I hope for those of you who are familiar with graph representation learning um, that this will you know, give you some some interesting insights and kind of a high level maybe theoretical um, understanding that, that maybe you hadn't thought of before. For those of you who aren't familiar with the area, I hope this serves as um, an interesting kind of crash course. Uh, and also uh, I hope to you know, be able to talk a little bit about some of the, the open challenges and kind of um, recent trends in this area. And of time permitting, of course, maybe talk about um, some very recent work by my group and I will say that very happy to take questions throughout. Um, there's, you know, kind of natural pausing points and you can just put them in the chat. I think that often works well and, and I can answer those as I go. Um, if I get through, you know, all my slides, that's great. But if I get through a portion because we had lots of questions, that's, you know, even better in some ways. Okay, so when we're talking about graph structure data, I mean, this being a seminar on uh, you know, network science, I think everyone's familiar with the kinds of data sets that we have in mind, but I think it's worth bringing up what are the, the sorts of graph structured or, or network structured data sets that I'm often thinking about and that I'll kind of implicitly have um, in the background during this talk. So social networks is an obvious one, um, but in addition to things like social networks, in my research and for the kind of methods I'll talk about today, some other really important data sets include things like knowledge graphs. So here is really just, just a graph structured representation of a relational database where you have the nodes corresponding to entities uh, and you have the, the edges being typed edges that correspond to different kinds of logical relationships between these entities. So it's a very popular uh, knowledge representation format um, growing in popularity a lot uh, in industry. Related to this are biomedical networks, uh, which often can be thought of as, as knowledge graphs where we might have entities say uh, representing proteins and then edges representing interactions. Perhaps one of the most popular areas right now for some of the graph neural network and graph representation learning techniques that I'll discuss is uh, molecule structures. So we're trying to do things like uh, predicting the uh, properties of molecules based on their graph structure. And there's also a lot of really other exciting areas, uh, even representing the syntax of language and, and code syntax via graph or tree structures. And of course, representing things like networks of neurons. So at Montreal and McGill here, we have the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute. So there's lots of really exciting data sets uh, coming more from the uh, neural connectome. So in terms of the tasks that I'll have in mind, um, I'll mention just a, you know, Few of the, the, the canonical ones that's going to motivate the techniques I'll discuss. So first is node classification. So here um, it, it's in some ways a semi-supervised task. We're given an input graph. We know labels on some of the nodes. We're missing labels on other nodes and we're trying to use a learning algorithm to infer these missing labels. And an example of this in the real world is something like classifying the function of proteins based on their position in the interactome. Another very important canonical task is this task of link prediction or relation prediction. So here we have our input graph, but we're uncertain about some edges. And so we're trying to use our learning algorithm to infer whether or not these missing edges exist. Uh, and a really exciting application of this is uh, things like computational drug repurposing. So we know interactions between drugs and certain diseases. We know interactions between diseases and certain proteins or certain genes. 
And we can think of this task of trying to predict missing relationships as being useful for drug repurposing. So we might be able to predict that this existing pharmaceutical compound might interact with this protein that interact with this other disease that we haven't tested before. And then finally, of course, there's classification task at the whole graph level, where we're trying, actually trying to classify an entire graph. And this is the graph learning task that's really most similar to traditional IID supervised machine learning. And a very popular example of this is trying to predict properties of molecules based on their graph structure. So there's really been a, a drastic increase in interest in this um, idea of deep learning or, or representation learning on graphs. So just as one kind of um, you know, somewhat silly but useful representation of that is just looking at uh, trends that you see on something like Google search. And you can see that you know, the interest in people searching for things like graph neural network uh, is starting to you know, approach the interest for recurrent neural networks, which is plateaued and is maybe even decreasing slightly um, due to RNNs you know, being a technique that's been well established for many years now. So what I wanna talk about today is first to give a brief history of graph representation learning and to really set the stage. So for those of you who are familiar with this area, this will be um, a brief review. For those of you who are less familiar with graph representation learning and graph neural nets, this will be a crash course, but it'll give us the, the background, the shared vocabulary that we need to then introduce two theoretical paradigms. So I'll discuss how graph neural networks uh, which are the core technique in graph representation learning used now, how they can be motivated and theoretically understood, both from a signal processing perspective as based on connections to convolutions, as well as theoretically based on their connections to graph isomorphism testing. And then these theoretical discussions are then going to reveal some of the limitations of the current paradigms that we use in this area. And I'll discuss uh, three open problems um, which are all related to some fundamental limitations of current models. And this will hopefully give us some, some motivation, at least for the kinds of problems that my group is thinking about in this space, and that really have uh, gained a lot of uh, attention in the last uh, six to 12 months or so. And as was uh, alluded to in the beginning, um, this content today is based primarily off a recent monogram, so a short textbook, so it's based on a course I taught uh, last year on graph representation learning. Um, it's available on my website, so there is a published version, um, but you can also look at the uh, free pre-publication draft, which doesn't include the, the nice um, copy editing and, and image formatting, but definitely has all the content in there. Okay, so starting first uh, with this history or a brief history of graph representation learning, um, and beginning with a bit of background and motivation. So if we're thinking about graph representation learning and contrasting this with general approaches for uh, say network analysis. So, so what distinguishes graph representation learning from more general work uh, on analyzing graph or network structured data, it's really that we're trying to go from graph structures to a low dimensional vector representation, usually a Euclidean representation, although there's interest in using uh, non-Euclidean spaces like hyperbolic spaces for also representing graphs. And you can think of this uh, in one sense as this problem of going from a node to a vector or also going from a graph to a vector. So how can we map all the nodes in our input graph to some useful low dimensional representations? And it's worth thinking about why this is hard. Um, and of course, th there's a long history of trying to learn embeddings or, or low dimensional approximations of graph from a variety of different fields. But part of how I wanna motivate this now is thinking of, of this perspective of trying to apply a successful toolbox of modern deep learning. So the successes we've seen on say images and on natural language to the problem of graph or network data. And the challenge in trying to adapt, you know, the most successful techniques from deep learning over the past 10 or so years is that these methods were designed for some geometrically simple objects. So in particular, convolutional neural networks are really designed for fixed size images uh, or, or grids in, in general. Uh, so these convolutional neural network techniques work really well, but they, they make some specific geometric assumptions and really they're the assumption that you're working with grid structured data. Similarly, recurrent neural networks 
have uh, worked extremely well for things like audio, speech recognition, uh, text processing, time series analysis, but they really only work for sequence data, which you know corresponds to something like a chain graph. And if we're thinking about having techniques for representation learning on general graphs, well, they lack this regular geometric structure. Uh, so one important consequence of this is that there's, for example, no straightforward notion of spatial locality um, in the same way that we have on simple Euclidean grids. So in graphs, you can have all kinds of complicated structures, um, you know, geometrically and topologically in, in terms of say having one node that's neighbors with all the other nodes in the graph, or you, know, you have a star graph, or you could have a fully connected graph or all the things in between. And this means that the, the notion of having say a local patch or notions of um, you know, transitivity of distance and, and all these kinds of things get, get a lot more complicated when we're working with general graph data. Another really interesting challenge with graph data, which at first glance seems somewhat just like a, you know, a problem of, of how we're trying to encode graphs um, into representations on a computer, but is actually quite fundamental, is the inherent symmetries that we have. So if we assume that we're representing graphs using adjacency matrices, which I'll always denote with a bold face A, we have this problem that we have these symmetries that we need to deal with. So in particular, if we're trying to define any graph level representation learning function, this function really needs to be invariant to node permutations. And what I mean by this is that if I have some graph level function F and I apply this function to a permutation of the adjacency matrix, I should get the same output as applying it on the first adjacency matrix. So again, applying this function on the permuted adjacency matrix should give me the same result as applying it on the original adjacency matrix. And that's because permuting the adjacency matrix is not a fundamentally, is not fundamentally changing the structure of the graph. We're just relabeling the nodes and shuffling around the rows and columns in this matrix, but we're keeping the graph structure the same. So there's this symmetry that we need to satisfy in our learning techniques. So at the graph level, we have this invariance uh, constraint. At the node level, uh, we have what we call an equivariance constraint, meaning that if we apply our node level function, so say we have a function that's mapping all the nodes in our graph to low dimensional embeddings, if we apply this function to a permutation of the input adjacency matrix, what we should get out is just a permutation of the same embeddings. So again, the idea here is that if I simply just reorder or relabel all the nodes in my graph, but don't change the structure, I should get the same embeddings or the same representations for the nodes that I had before. I should just be reordering uh, my you know, matrix or my list of embeddings in an analogous way. And this is actually very important. So these problems of you know, dealing with these symmetries is connected to the fact that graph isomorphism testing is really this implicit bottleneck when we're trying to do representation learning on graphs. So even just determining whether or not two graphs are the same is computationally difficult. It's NP indeterminate. And the optimization problem we're really trying to solve here is this problem of saying, does there exist a permutation matrix that maps these two adjacency matrices onto one another? And again, this points out this, this challenge with working with graphs, which even knowing whether or not we have the same input is a computationally difficult problem. Uh, so, we, uh, oh. sorry. Uh, so I understand why that property of isomorphism is that you mentioned on the last slide is appealing. But if it's the computationally hard part, uh, why not not do it? Like, can't you oh, just great. like like you haven't argued that it's necessary? And in particular, since neural networks are randomized anyway we might be satisfied with something that was that worked well over, for example, most random orderings. That's a really actually good point. So I think a good analogy is, which really brings up your, your, your comment is say working with uh, image or point cloud data. So right, if we're working with point cloud data, when we're making say a classification on whether or not this particular point cloud has some property, our classification function really should be, say, invariant to 
you know, the action of, um, you know, maybe the SO3 group, right? So we want to be able to rotate it and, and reflect it and all these things that shouldn't change our prediction. It's still the same um, object, still the same point cloud, but we don't always explicitly enforce those invariances or those symmetries, especially in, in deep learning. So yeah, often you do that by augmenting the training set. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, and in fact, in the graph setting, people have done both. So most of the techniques I'll talk about today bake in this invariance um, without big computational cost, I'll say. So it doesn't add a, a large computational cost. There's really a, a pretty, well, right, right, right now, what's really the, the dominant uh, computational paradigm for graph neural nets that just gives you this these symmetries for free in, in some sense. Um, but there are other techniques where we do actually just work with random permutations. So we do the, the, uh, the analogy of data augmentation like you would do for images. And those techniques are provably more powerful in some ways actually, but they're actually more expensive. So it's a little bit of an interesting, um, people have shown that if you give up on satisfying these symmetries and say just work with a whole bunch of different random permutations that you can achieve really good performance actually. Although it tends to be pretty expensive. And the reason for that is because, so in images, things like the rotation group, they have a fair bit of structure, right? So when you rotate by 45 degrees and by 35 degrees and by 25 degrees, there's a bit of kind of systematicity in that, um, in the sense that, you know, these different rotations are kind of related. And so your model can learn to generalize without that much data. Whereas permutations, are, you know, there isn't really any relationship between one permutation and another permutation. So you end up where you need to cover a lot of the permutation space um, in order for your model to learn and do well. So it's a really good point though. So I actually won't talk about these kind of data augmentation style approaches, but they do work well. And uh, it's definitely something that has been shown to, to improve performance. Again, with, you know, probably a, maybe a 10 X increase in, in, in amount of training that you need to do, which is, you know, reasonable in many settings. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's a very good question though. Okay. So that was just a brief introduction into why this problem of representation learning on graphs is difficult. Um, I'll pause here in case there are any other questions before I, I jump into a brief overview of the key methodologies in this space. And again, if you want to, to just speak, that's totally fine, or uh, I'll open up the chat so I can see it if people post questions. And I will keep the chat uh, so I can see it. So if you have questions uh, while I'm going, I'll keep an eye on that. Okay, so the first, uh, I would say the, the dominant approach for representation learning on graphs for many years, which is quite connected to um, a number of historical techniques, things like uh, multidimensional scaling and uh, dimensionality reduction techniques in general, is this approach of what we call node embedding. Um, and the idea here is that we simply wanna map the nodes in our input graph to some low dimensional, usually Euclidean space. And what we want is we want the distance or, or typically the, the dot product um, so something like the Euclidean distance in this low dimensional embedding space to reflect some notion of similarity in the original input graph. So these kinds of techniques, how they work you now, typically what we're trying to do is, is, for example, have the dot product, say, approximate um, the probability of two nodes occurring on a random walk or having the dot product of their low dimensional embeddings maybe um, correspond to the likelihood of there being an edge between them. So we're really just in some ways trying to learn a low dimensional representation or a low dimensional factorization of the original adjacency matrix. So these techniques uh, were very popular. They were really um, driving a lot of very successful empirical results in this space um, through, you know, for, for decades, um, but they do have some limitations and these limitations are really what motivated the, these modern graph neural networks. So first off, when we're thinking of these traditional node embedding techniques, uh, typically how they were done is that every single node 
we're learning a unique embedding vector for that node. So what we're learning is an embedding matrix where every node has its own representation and we're directly optimizing the representation for each node. And what this means is that the number of parameters that we want to learn, if we want to learn node embeddings for all the nodes in our graph is going to be linear in the number of nodes that we have. So we're kind of directly optimizing representations for each node. This also means that these techniques are inherently uh, we, what we can call transductive. And what I mean by that is with these traditional kind of dimensionality reduction or, or node embedding techniques, we learn representations for all the nodes that we have in the training graph and the graph that we're given. But if we're then given a new graph, we can't generate, we have no inductive model that can then generate representations for this new graph. We have to run our same learning algorithm separately on this other graph. And there's no way to easily even compare the embeddings that we learn between different graphs. Um, they're actually from almost all of these methods kind of not easily comparable. Um, they're not connected to one another. And this is a, an issue. So these techniques kind of learn dimensionality reduction. So low dimensional embeddings of a specific graph, but they don't generalize in a way that, that we expect from a machine learning method. And then lastly, something that's maybe less fundamental, but important is that these traditional techniques for node embeddings, they were really just doing dimensionality reduction on the adjacency matrix. And many of the graphs that we care about in the real world don't just have an adjacency matrix, they also have feature information. So we have information at the nodes, maybe in social networks, you know, profile pictures and uh, text information and protein networks will have information um, about the properties of these proteins and, and, and so on. And so the key distinction that led to these graph neural network techniques is going from what we call these shallow traditional node embeddings, where the idea here is that we're encoding every node into a low dimensional embedding just by optimizing a unique embedding vector for that node. So you can think of this as that what we're learning is an embedding matrix, where if our dimensionality is D, this embedding matrix will have say V different columns, where we have one column for every node in our graph. In graph neural networks, we do something else where we say, I want to learn a model that's going to generate representations for all the nodes in my graph. And in particular, this model, this encoding function, which maps a node to a low dimensional embedding is going to be a function of the adjacency matrix, as well as the node features that I have. The idea is that I'm actually going to learn an, an inductive, a, a generalizable function that maps adjacency structures to representations. What graph neural networks look like, at least um, the, the vast majority of graph neural networks, is they have this computational structure. So the idea, what I'm showing on the left here is a simple little input graph. And then on the right is the structure of a graph neural network that generates a representation for the particular target node A here in this input graph. And the way that this works is that to get the representation for A or the prediction on node A, we're going to aggregate information from A's local neighbors. So here from nodes B, C, and D. And this aggregation is uh, done using the neural network. So the, the gray boxes here represent some neural networks and I'll describe what these actually look like in the coming slides. But the key idea is that A is receiving what we often call vector messages from its neighbors, B, C, and D. In turn, these neighbors, B, C, and D, they're sending information to A that's based on information that they're aggregating from their local neighborhood and so on. And so what I've shown here is a two layer graph neural net. So to get the representation of node A, this depends on information that's being aggregated from the two hop neighborhood around this node A. And you could also make this deeper. And as you make the graph neural net deeper and deeper, um, so you have more of these layers, you're aggregating information from further and further reaches of the graph. And this idea is often called neural message passing because people think of um, these individual edges in this computation graph shown here on the right as being akin to uh, the neighbors sending, uh, sorry, the nodes sending messages to their neighbors. So, so, so this is going to be the training part? Yeah, so I'll show, so this is, uh, this is a, another great question. So what I'm showing here, so this is the, the math version of what I showed uh, in the previous slide. So this is the forward model. Uh, where 
what this gives us. So after I run, so after I run my graph neural net, I get embeddings or I have representations for all of my nodes. And then I could use those for say node classification and have some say cross entropy loss, I will, whatever downstream task I have, I can use the loss from that downstream task to optimize the parameters of this model. So this is, this is the definition of the, um, the kind of forward inference in the model. The training is then done using, you know, typically just stochastic gradient descent or some variant of it. Um, but yeah, the, I'm being somewhat agnostic with respect to what the particular task is. We're just assuming that we want to have representations for all of our nodes that then we could use in any, so you know, the classification task, we'd basically just have say a, a soft max uh, classification layer, and then we get a negative log likelihood loss and use that to optimize our GNN model. But the, the forward model um, is going to be identical at both training and at testing. Does that uh, answer your question? Uh, yes. And the other thing is that you have, there is also a neural net that for each one. Yeah, so let me maybe, I'll, I'll go over this equation and hopefully that will clarify things. And if not, then I'll, I'll definitely hopefully clarify uh, the questions that remain. So, so to give the, the bit more detail, so, so the way that the kind of forward model uh, in a GNN works is that we start off by initializing what we call the layer zero embeddings as being equal to our input node features. Then the graph neural net is defined by these recursive e equations where the kth layer embedding of a node is a nonlinear function, typically a, a ReLU or a TANH or a sigmoid applied to information that we're aggregating from this node's neighbors, from their representations at the previous layer, as well as the previous layer embedding of this node. And then the parameters that we're optimizing are these W matrices at each layer, as well as the bias term. So this update equation, as I'm showing here, is essentially, so this is a, a basic graph neural net. There, there's more complicated variants of this, but it, it looks a lot like a, for example, um, a recurrent neural network, but instead of having our recurrence just be kind of temporally across temporal hidden states, this recurrence is aggregating information from local neighborhoods on the graph. So we can do say uh, K layers of this model, and then we'll use the embeddings we get at the final layer to make our predictions. So really this is, when I, when I said in the, in the previous slide that we're doing this aggregation via neural networks, really what I mean is that we're defining something like this function I'm showing here, which is a, a basic, this is the most basic uh, graph neural network where we're just taking the sum of information from our neighbors, multiplying by a linear matrix, and then also taking the information from the node's previous representation, again, just doing a linear transformation and then having a nonlinearity. So this is you know, kind of a, the analog of a simple RNN or a simple multilayer perceptron, but where we're actually leveraging the structure of the graph. Any uh, more questions on that? Okay. So in terms of the advantages of this kind of approach, so one thing that's really nice about this is that the number of parameters that we need in this GNN is independent from the size of the graph. So again, what we're learning in this model are these transformation matrices, similar to you know, just the weight matrices in a neural net. And the size of these matrices depends on the size of our embeddings. So the, you know, the size of our input features or um, the hidden embedding size that we're choosing as a hyperparameter, but it doesn't depend on how many nodes we have in our graph. So the number of parameters in our graph neural net is uncoupled from the size of the graph. And another way of looking at this from this previous picture here is that this graph neural net, as I'm showing here, when we're generating a representation for a node A, we're doing that by aggregating information from the local neighborhood structure. And I've shown these gray boxes, but the key idea is that all these gray boxes, so all the dark gray boxes, they're all the same neural network. 
it's all the same parameters and this light gray box, you know, if we were to use this to generate embeddings for any other nodes, again, we'd just be reusing the same parameters. So the idea is that rather than learning representations for all of our nodes independently, we're learning a single model that can generate representations by aggregating local neighborhood information. Another related benefit of this is that we can use this model after we've trained it and we can make predictions on graphs that we've never seen before, as long as these graphs have the same um, schema. So, so the same you know, type of features and things like that. So we can generalize to unseen data. And then of course, based on how we're doing this, where the model is learning by aggregating information on local neighborhoods, naturally these models can incorporate feature information. If we don't have feature information, we can just use things like node degree and other things as our input features. So what I showed previously was, as I said, this basic graph neural net, the more general form of graph neural net, um, which was first a uh, variation of this introduced by Justin Gilmer um, in their ICML 2017 paper, is based on what we often call the neural message passing or the aggregate and update paradigm. The idea here is that at every layer of a graph neural net, we get an updated node representation by aggregating information from local node neighborhoods. So we have some aggregation function, which is some neural network that's taking the set of representations from this node's neighbors and aggregating this into what we call the, the message from the neighbors. And then we're combining this message from the neighbors with the node's previous representation in what we call the update function in order to get the new embedding for this node. And here, just to highlight related to uh, one of the questions that was asked previously, if this aggregation function is permutation invariant, then the graph neural network model on a whole is permutation equivariant. And if we then average the final node embeddings with or aggregate the final node embeddings to get a graph level embedding with a permutation invariant function, we're also invariant. So as long as we're aggregating with a permutation invariant function, we satisfy the symmetries of, uh, of, of graph representations that we mentioned earlier. So for example, here we're using a sum, which is a permutation invariant aggregation. Um, there's many different things that you can use. So to give a couple examples, um, you can use attention-based aggregation. Um, there's also many techniques which are based on what are called set pooling where you apply uh, say multi-layer perceptrons before doing the sum to increase the, the uh, expressiveness. But there are also techniques that use permutation sensitive functions here. And then we have to run multiple different um, versions of the model with different random permutation orderings. And those models actually can achieve uh, pretty strong performance. And so similar to the aggregation function, the other key function we have here, this update function, which says, okay, I aggregate information from my neighbors to get this message from my neighbors. And now I need to update my representation based on this aggregated message. Um, there's many things one can do again in our simple model here, just to remind us this update function is just a sum of the information from the neighbors, as well as the node's previous representation. You can also do things based on uh, models like gated recurrent units. You can do things that are motivated by residual connections. Um, there's many, I would say, uh, certainly hundreds of variations of how we can define these aggregation and update functions. So just to close off this section before I dive into some of the theory, I just want to highlight some of the um, empirical places where GNNs ha have really had a big impact in recent years. Uh, so one is in drug design or drug repurposing. So the idea here is we're using graph neural nets to learn representations of molecules based on their graph structure. So we run our GNN, get embeddings for all of our nodes. Then we pool all these embeddings together, say by just taking their sum. And then we use this learned representation to make a prediction about say the solubility or bioactivity of a particular molecule. And there was a paper recently uh, in Cell, for example, from the MIT group, which actually showed that using this technique, uh, they could predict novel antibiotics for uh, antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria. Uh, and some colleagues of mine at Mila are, are also considering how we can combine 
these graph neural networks with reinforcement learning to allow us to effectively search over molecule space. So the idea is that we can predict you know, the, uh, how likely a particular molecule is to be useful for say treating a particular disease. And we can use this model in order to explore the space of possible drugs uh, via reinforcement learning much, much more efficiently than just say naively searching over all of the, um, you know, well, 10 to the, whatever it is, 10 to the 10 possible drugs that there are out there. Wait, wait um, well, just a quick question on that. Is that, mm -hmm. is that generating new molecular structure or is it more like a classifier where if you gave it sort of an altered structure, it would say if it's good or not? That, that's a great, so the, the graph neural net is kind of just the the value function telling you whether or not this is a good molecule. Uh, the generation part of it, so there's a number of approaches, but when, for example, what we're using at Mila, so what I mentioned here in this um, Lambda Zero initiative, as it's called, is that you have the graph neural net that's telling you, you know, is this a good molecule or not? And then you have a reinforcement learning agent that basically its actions are adding uh, different molecular building blocks that we know. And then there's, you know, penalties for how hard it is to synthesize a particular molecule. So the generation is done using say a reinforcement learning agent typically. And then the GNN is what's giving you kind of the score or like the, the reward estimate. And then typically actually, you know, the GNN is giving you this fast approximate award, um, reward for how good a molecule is. And then once you say, look, this is maybe a good candidate, you then run a much more expensive, say, physics-based simulation to kind of verify how good the score is. Um, so the GNN is, it's useful as a, you know, as a very accurate um, but imperfect estimator of various molecular properties. And then typically, once you've reduced the number of candidates, you'll use a more expensive uh, technique to actually do the do the validation. Yeah, it sounds super cool. So it's basically bypassing the simulation in this loop, which could be really expensive. exactly. Yeah, so it's it's really this well, you know, the the lead discovery, right? So like kind of the the generation of promising candidates. I'm I actually so in the Stokes et al. cell paper, they were not using. I believe there they were just using the graph neural net for screening, so taking a list of known approved compounds and then just saying which of these might be good for you know uh, attacking this particular bacteria so not doing generation just screening which is another very popular so there's you know the computational drug design and then there's just the repurposing um, and i believe they were just doing the repurposing in this one so just using it for screening thank you and one more question while you're yeah. at it. Um, and uh, you have the node um, embeddings and your aggregation is just adding up the node uh, embeddings to get a label for the whole graph. Is that how it works? Yeah, it's so just adding them up is actually pretty common, um, especially for molecule settings. There are more sophisticated uh, techniques at which in a longer version of this talk, I would go into. Um, so you can do, for example, you can use say coarsening techniques where rather than just adding up all of the node embeddings, you instead use some uh, graph coarsening routine to get a coarser version of your graph and just add up the nodes that have been coarsened together and then you rerun your graph neural net. So there's kind of hierarchical approaches. Um, there, there's been many variations, but surprisingly just taking the sum of all the node representations for small graphs like molecules works quite well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is the feature space is uh, equal length in this in the vector in, in the, doing the aggregation? Uh, oh yeah, so the the feature space is de is of a fixed dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, the other um, very popular place where graph neural nets have had a very big impact is in recommendation systems. So I won't go into this in, in detail. I'm showing here one example of a collaboration we have with Pinterest, uh, where we used graph neural nets to power their recommendation system. But it, it's, it's a space where there, there are many, say, um, large um, 
companies doing e-commerce, doing social media, where inherently their data corresponds to a graph, say a graph between customers and products, and where graph neural net based techniques uh, can give pretty substantial gains in terms of performance per say recommending content to individuals. But what I wanna make sure I have some time for it is to dive in a little bit onto uh, some of the theoretical perspectives of GNN. So what we have now is a bit of a foundations in terms of you know the high level uh, overview of how basic GNNs work. Again, uh, glossing over a lot of details um, and trying to synthesize uh, many different methods in just a few minutes. But what I wanna make sure I get through is, is this idea of how graph neural nets can really be motivated and even derived based on two different theoretical paradigms. And it's actually quite interesting because graph neural nets were independently um, derived or kind of um, designed from two different perspectives. Uh, so the first is actually coming from more of a signal processing perspective where we're thinking about how to generalize convolutions to non-Euclidean data. And the second is actually more related to theoretical motivations from graph theory and the problem of graph isomorphism testing. So I'm gonna start by giving a, you know, a quick crash course in, in how graph neural nets can be motivated as a, um, a generalization in some ways of convolutions to non-Euclidean data. So first off, the intuition here is that if we had a grid, then we look at the operation of this graph neural network where essentially what we're doing is we're looking at every node and then looking you know, say at the sum or at some aggregation of all the information from their neighborhood, which would really be akin to something like a center surround convolutional filter. And so this intuition can actually be expanded to a real theoretical connection, which is the fact that graph neural nets can be actually derived as an adaptation or, or generalization of convolutions to the graph domain based on this idea of what's called graph Fourier analysis. So this graph Fourier analysis uh, is quite connected actually to things like spectral graph theory for those of you who are, who are familiar. Uh, and it's based on a few key facts. So the first fact is that we can define what we call the Laplacian operator for a graph. So there's many variations of the Laplacian. Here I'm defining what's called the symmetric normalized Laplacian, where what we're doing is we're taking the identity matrix and subtracting from the identity matrix a symmetric normalized version of the adjacency matrix, where we're normalizing uh, symmetrically just based on the degrees of all the nodes. The reason why this Laplacian matrix is interesting is that it's a matrix that can allow us to measure how a signal differs between the neighbors on a graph. So in particular, if I have a vector X, which represents a signal on the graph, so it's just a one-dimensional feature where every node has some value, and if I multiply this input signal, this input vector X by the Laplacian, and I look at the resulting entry for a particular node, this essentially measures the average difference between the signal value at this node and its neighbors. So this Laplace operator is really like a difference operator on graphs. It measures how much a signal is changing between its neighbors. And here we're normalizing by, by degree. And this is called the Laplacian operator or the, or the Laplacian matrix on a graph because it's really a discretized analog of the more general Laplace operator um, on Euclidean spaces or on manifolds, um, often, often called the Laplace Beltrami operator. And what this Laplace operator is, is it's a function that measures the divergence of the gradient of some other function. And again, the way to think about this is it measures how much does the value of a function differ between each point and the immediate neighborhood around this point. So it's like a difference operator. If you're working on a time series, the Laplace operator is gonna give you the first difference of this time series. So how much does the time series change over each time step? So it's a very fundamental operator. And in fact, we have this intuitive connection, but how we can leverage this is based on the idea that, that this Laplace operator has a really important um, fundamental mathematical fact about it, which is the fact that the eigenfunctions of this Laplace operator actually correspond to the Fourier mode, so the, the sinusoidal plane wave. So when we're doing 
Fourier decomposition. So I am not uh, somebody who works primarily on signal processing, and there's definitely many ways to, to, to motivate Fourier decomposition and Fourier analysis. But one of the ways you can think of Fourier analysis is that we are representing a signal in the eigenbasis of the Laplace operator. Again, that's not the only way to derive Fourier analysis, but that's one way of deriving it is to say that I wanna represent a signal on the eigenbasis of the Laplace operator. And again, that's based on this fundamental mathematical connection that the eigenbasis of the Laplace operator are the sinusoidal plane waves. And the way we can leverage this connection is we can leverage this connection by actually saying that, okay, I'm gonna do graph Fourier analysis by representing the signals or the features on my graph in the eigenbasis of the graph Laplacian. So regular Fourier analysis representing things in the eigenbasis of the Laplace operator on Euclidean space. So let's represent uh, or do Fourier transform on graphs by going into the eigenbasis of the graph Laplacian. Because the graph Laplacian is just a matrix, um, we can actually just compute the eigen decomposition of this matrix. And then we can define a graph Fourier transform actually quite simply as just being a multiplication by the inverse or the transpose because it's uh, orthonormal matrix uh, by the inverse of the Laplacian eigenvectors. So if I have a signal on a graph, the Fourier or the graph Fourier transform of that signal, we get by just multiplying that signal by the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. And we can do the inverse graph Fourier transform by just multiplying uh, by the eigenvectors themselves. We can then define a convolution on a graph, again, based on the fundamental fact that really a convolution is an operation that is an element-wise multiplication in Fourier space. So after that's how we can define a convolution in, in general, is it's an operation that is um, an element-wise multiplication when we have a Fourier decomposition of a signal. So to do a graph convolution, what we can do is we can take the graph Fourier transform of two signals or of a signal and a filter, do element-wise multiplication in this graph Fourier space, and then do the inverse graph Fourier transform back out. And one really important intuition or interpretation here is that the eigenvectors of a graph Laplacian, they're like the basis for a Fourier decomposition. And then the eigenvalues play the roles of frequencies. So the lower eigenvalues are low frequencies, the higher eigenvalues are like high frequencies. And it's very much a, um, a, a true connection in that if you do, for example, the um, build the graph Laplacian of, uh, of a chain graph with boundary conditions, you just get back the discrete Fourier transform. So we get back our regular notions of frequencies and uh, waves. Okay, so what does it actually have to do with graph neural nets? Well, in practice, we can actually define convolutions, valid convolutions on graphs based on polynomials of the normalized adjacency matrix. The reason for this is that any polynomial of the adjacency matrix can be simultaneously diagonalized with the Laplacian. And what that means is that if I multiply any input signal on my graph, by a polynomial of the adjacency matrix, that is actually equivalent to taking the graph Fourier transform of this input signal, multiplying it by a diagonal matrix, and then taking the inverse graph Fourier transform. So based on all these connections, the key consequence is that anytime I multiply an input signal by a polynomial of my adjacency matrix or a symmetric normalized version of my adjacency matrix, this really is a convolution. And when we're thinking about graph neural nets, the way that we aggregate information from neighbors is really analogous and in most cases actually equivalent to multiplying by a polynomial of the adjacency matrix. So if I'm doing just a simple thing of taking the sum of all my neighbor representations or the average of all my neighbor representations, that's really just multiplying my input feature matrix by the adjacency matrix. So it's just actually a simple uh, order one convolution. And in fact, many or most, I should say, graph neural nets can be viewed as a combination of simple graph convolutional filters. So polynomials of the adjacency matrix multiplied by the input signal 
combined with some linear projections and nonlinearities, just like convolutional neural nets. So in convolutional neural nets, we combine uh, convolutions with nonlinearities and other transformations. And we can really think about graph neural nets as being completely analogous. So this is this really interesting deep connection. And in fact, you can build different kinds of graph neural nets by leveraging this connection, by trying to think about how to have um, convolutions that focus on high versus mid versus low frequency signals and so on. Okay, so I'll pause for a minute there because in case there are questions on that, um, I would like to answer those even if it means I don't get through all of the rest. If not, I will move on. Okay, so in the last few minutes then, um, cause this is definitely um, probably the, the last content that I'll have time to get through to make sure there are time for some questions at the end is now the connection between graph neural nets and graph isomorphism. So what's really interesting is that we can motivate graph neural nets, this idea of aggregating information from local neighborhoods as a generalization of convolutions, but we can also motivate it based on a connection to a traditional graph isomorphism test. So the high level idea here is that graph neural nets are actually a continuous and differentiable version of a classic graph isomorphism algorithm called the WL test. And I should give a, a full disclosure here that when I started work on graph neural networks, I actually derived or justified the way that I built um, my early work in this space called graph sage exactly in this way as being a differentiable version of this traditional isomorphism test. And only later did I um, understand uh, the connections to convolutions. So I came more from, from this isomorphism perspective. So this wiesfire lehman algorithm, which is one of the most fundamental approximate isomorphism testing algorithms, the way it works is as follows. And, and as you'll see, as I'm going over this algorithm, it really has important connections or analogies to the way that, that the GNNs work. So the way the WL algorithm works is that we initialize each node with what we call a color or a label corresponding to its degree. And then for each iteration of this algorithm, every node gets a new label that corresponds to the multi-set of labels in its local neighborhood. So every node's looking at all of its neighbors, it's aggregating the labels in its local neighborhood and giving itself a new label based on this multi-set. We can then do this over and over. And as we go, we can represent all the nodes in our graph with these discrete multi-sets then at the very end, if we want to say test whether or not two graphs are isomorphic, we just compare the set of labels that we get after running this algorithm for a number of iterations. And what's really interesting is that graph neural nets really are just a continuous and differentiable version of this. In the WL algorithm, we initialize every node with a discrete label. Graph neural net, we initialize every node with a continuous feature input. The WL algorithm at each iteration we get a new label for each node by hashing the multi-set of labels in the local neighborhood. In a graph neural net, we get a new continuous embedding by applying some neural network to the set of embeddings in the local neighborhood. So they really are quite analogous to one another and in fact uh, can be proved. So we proved in 2019 that in fact, there exists a parameter setting for a basic GNN such that it is as powerful as the WL algorithm. So we know that graph neural nets are as powerful as this traditional isomorphism algorithm. And in fact, any graph neural network that has this update and aggregate paradigm that I discussed where we use a permutation invariant aggregation function is no more powerful in terms of distinguishing graphs than this traditional WL algorithm. So it's actually a really interesting deep theoretical connection between these two. So I think with that, um, I had uh, a lot of great questions throughout and in the interest of making sure people um, who have commitments at 1 p.m. Uh, can make it to them, I will call it there, um, skip over my, my last few slides and just uh, acknowledge all of my students, uh, my funding agencies and my collaborators who helped out throughout this work and take a minute to see if there are any final questions. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, uh, for the presentation. Um, one question that I had was that, uh, you know, these polynomials that you apply for the um, graph convolution. Uh, so you mentioned that it has to be uh, permutation independent, right? Mm -hmm. Does that satisfy? Yeah, so it, this is actually really interesting. So the reason for it is because, so any polynomial of the adjacency matrix commutes with the adjacency matrix. Um, so, so that's another, another way of um, stating the, this permutation, permutation invariance or equivariance requirement is that you need your, your aggregation function to commute with multiplication by the adjacency matrix and any polynomial of A commutes with A. So okay. you do still get that in, in there. But there's some subtleties in terms of if you're using the symmetric normalized adjacency matrix, it commutes with a symmetric normalized, uh, you know, only with polynomials of itself. So you actually need to choose how you normalize your adjacency matrix and, and your Laplacian actually has kind of a kind of fundamental impact on the type of symmetry that you're enforcing in the end. Right. Yeah, that was basically my issue that, you know, you have the, the normalized Laplacian and then that may actually imply some restrictions. Yeah, so it, it's a good, so it's one of these interesting points where there's kind of no free lunch for discretized versions of the Laplacian. Huh. So there's different ones. There's symmetric normalized, there's other versions of it, um, non-normalized. The nice thing about the symmetric normalized is that the symmetric normalized adjacency matrix commutes with the symmetric normalized Laplacian. Mm -hmm. So they kind of, if you work with them, you kind of get both, but some of the other Laplacians don't commute with their adjacency matrix counterparts. Uh -huh. So that's why, I, that's why I like the symmetric normalized Laplacian. Right. Well, this is also connected to Chebyshev polynomials, right? Which are usually done on the Laplacian. Yeah, so there is one of the earliest works where they motivated, where, where they derived this convolutional graph neural net really from a convolutional perspective, they worked with Chebyshev polynomials of the Laplacian or of the symmetric, they, they were working with, with the symmetric normalized. So, so they were basically, the motivation there is that, you know, Chebyshev polynomials are, you know, we know and love them from numerical approximation as being good, um, you know, for trying to approximate other polynomials, it's good working with the Chebyshev basis. So, the idea there is that when we say, well, what polynomial of the Laplacian or what polynomial of the adjacency should, should I use? They said, well, let's use Chebyshev polynomials, um, which work quite well. There's been a number of other, um, which again, I'm less familiar with because I'm not somebody from um, more of these numerical methods, but there's other, like there's Cayley polynomials that some other people have been using, which have even more powerful approximation properties and things like that too. But the Chebyshev method works quite well. Uh, hi, I have a question. Oh yes, please go ahead. So if I just something simple, I take a graph I get with a, just a standard JC matrix and train a GNN on it and get these vectors for the nodes. And then I try to draw the graph, like I embed the graph with those vectors. What does the layout kind of look like? Like I'm thinking about things like UMAP or TSNI for graph embeddings, right? Like if I use a GNN to like create these uh, vectors for it, what would the graph embedding kind of look like when it draws it? It, it depends a lot on what loss function you're training it on. Um, so you can actually train your graph neuron, <coughs> your graph neuron at encoder mm -hmm. to generate embeddings that look like the, the UMAP in, in embeddings. Hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So basically you can make it. But, yes, but in general, what they look like is they look like if you took the SVD of the adjacency matrix. And just kept the top K. It's like um, a spectral embedding, kind of. Yeah, so so they look a lot like a spectral embedding. Got it. Cool. Typically. Uh, hi, I have a question. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, does GNN learn um, uh, the the node representations learned by GNN can have some information on the role that certain nodes are playing in this network? 
for example, is acting as, as a connector or is acting as a, you know, aggregator or based on its in and out degrees? This is a, a great question. So they can. Um, so, and there is actually work specifically analyzing graph neural nets ability to learn these structural roles. They are a little bit limited because one thing that they struggle with is they have a hard time detecting cycles. Um, so that, for example, graph neural nets are not very good at um, computing clustering coefficients as a particular example, um, just because of the, the way the computation is done. So yes, they can do this, but it's really not what they're best at. They're best at doing more of like a community detection like task, um, but they can do role detection as well. Um, but you typically augment them um, with some more recent kind of uh, innovations to, to help them do better for that for those tasks. So they used to mean like local computation. I guess it also depends on the aggregation function, right? Yes, like, exactly. Yeah, it depends saying, on, the, uh, on the aggregation function, yeah. And I think somebody else had a comment there. I was just saying the, they're good at local computation on, on networks, not things that are like involving, you know, things further. Yes. Away from the and that's another really good. So the, the graph neural nets, they have this the kind of local, right? They're kind of just an iterative local computations. So they struggle with their long range dependencies, right? Um, again, many real world graph tasks are basically just smoothing the signal on you. So for example, trying to predict, you know, what community somebody belongs to. It's not a very complicated function. It's basically just kind of smoothing um, over the graph where every node, their representation should just be smooth to look like their neighbors. So those are pretty easy functions, but functions that are long range or like what we call high frequency functions where the signal can change between immediate neighbors um, really easily, those are harder to learn. And that's kind of what people are most focused on now is making GNNs work better in, in those more challenging settings. Have they tried looking at things like maybe having the two hop neighbors in that aggregation stage? Yes, yeah, there's a really nice work, I believe it's called mix hop by some folks at Google Research that, that does um, exactly that. And there's also one um, following up on that where instead of using the adjacency matrix, they use um, uh, personalized page rank scores to do the propagation. So you're kind of propagating information over like the entire graph in every step. Um, so there's, yeah, there's quite a few extensions in that direction. Okay, very well. So um, I think um, uh, we have asked many, many questions. Uh, thank you very much again for, uh, for the great talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, so if no, you also you. have some, some, some time, I can send you uh, a link so that we can uh, chat for a few minutes. I wanted to talk I to you about Unfortunately, I actually have. Uh, I'll a send you an email. That, okay. Yeah, send me an email. I know because I, yeah. um, I, I told my next meeting that I would be, you know, ten or so minutes late, but I, yeah. I should uh, probably. But no, we can definitely. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to also send slides. Um, I guess it was recorded, yes. but if you want the slides as well, I'm happy. That to would be them. great. That would be also great, so that people have pointers to the papers. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of the week. Yeah. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you.